Hello. Welcome to the uh, Reiner Symposium. It's very nice to see such an audience at the time, at the moment of the Congress on the Sunday. Uh, we are very pleased to be here and uh, I'm very happy to have been invited and to uh, be uh, in the position of introducing this symposium and honored to uh, share this with such a brilliant uh, uh, team here. So um, without any further ado, I think I'm very happy to uh, welcome Professor Graham Barrett on stage. Graham deserves no introduction. He's one of the most famous uh, specialists of cataract, IOL power, IOL design that we have, and we are very privileged to be with him today. Uh, I have been uh, meeting Graham, I think, 15 years ago. I was very shy when I first met you. Since then, I'm very happy to be one of your friends. And uh, you are very inspirational, and um, what most of what I do today in this field is uh, I owe it to what you've done before. So thank you very much, uh, Graham, for being here. And uh, the keynote will be delivered by you. This will be about the art of designing IOL optics. Please, Graham. And I think we can applaud Graham. Damien, thank you so much, and uh, it's such a pleasure to be part of uh, this symposium, this Rainer Symposium uh, today. If you think about it, if we look back, cataract surgery began, was first described by Susruta in the 6th century before the Common Era. And um, since then, it's evolved into probably the most successful surgical procedure, restoring sight to millions of patients uh, each year. And there's many topics at this meeting which are fascinating, the, pros the prospect of accommodative lenses, new trends in antibiotic prophylaxis, the introduction of the uh, adjustable light IOL. But when I look at the program, I think one of the most interesting things is the large uptake of extended depth of focus IOLs as the lens of choice for so many surgeons. And of course, this is the theme of the Rainer Symposium. And my task is to introduce the uh, theme and provide a talk on the art of designing IOL optics. And I will draw your attention to my uh, interests in that I do have a patent on extended depth of focus IOLs. I invented this lens and have licensed this uh, to Rainer. And when we choose a lens for our patients, the optic design is probably one of the most important things which makes us select one lens for the other. And we choose a solution to patients' need for unaided near vision. After cataract surgery, based largely on the optic design. And to really discuss the topic, we have to understand the optical principles. We need clinical data, and some of my uh, speakers who will follow me will, will talk about clinical data and patient outcomes, and also perhaps an element of philosophy. One of my interests and hobbies is astronomy. And it's quite fascinating that you can determine the quality of an optic of a telescope by simply adjusting the adjustable focus of the eyepiece. And whenever I do this, it reminds me, of course, of the adjustable focus of the human eye. Of course, there's a problem when we implant a pseudophagic monofocal lens, we lose that adjustable focus. I'm old enough to remember the excitement at the EIIC, which was the precursor of ESCRS, <clears throat> in 1988 in Copenhagen, when the principle of a diffractive IOL was first described. Uh, and you may be surprised, but I was one of the first surgeons to implant this 3M diffractive IOL. I was also excited 
but the limitations of diffractive optics of multiple focal planes soon became apparent with the compromise in optical quality, and I somewhat lost my enthusiasm. And really, when we use multifocal lens, we compromise. It's like a Faustian bargain, because instead of a single focus, the light is distributed to different focal planes. There's a reduction in light energy, an increase in dysphotopsia, and optical quality, and a decrease in optical quality. If you look at this paper from 2007, and these are actual images of a Snellen chart comparing a monofocal optic to a diffractive multifocal optic, you can see the difference in image quality. And you may look at this and say, well, how do patients tolerate this reduction in contrast? And there is an element of neuroadaptation, uh, suppressing monoptic su suppression. But also, I think the fact that patients usually start off with reduced contrast anyway because they have cataracts <clears throat> or dysfunctional lens syndrome, and this improves after their cataract surgery and implant, and this may, to some extent, explain some of the reasons they accept what is an obvious optical compromise. When we look at the literature, um, it's clear that diffractive optics are associated with unwanted halo and optical phenomena. And this does include trifocal implants, as you see in this comparison, which was previously published. We also know that um, newer diffractive optics, such as trifocal lenses, do provide something that was missing, which is intermediate vision. But if you look at the trifocal, this is the bottom layer on this display, you can see there is better intermediate, but it's not as good as either the distance or the near. It's not that impressive. So by definition, extended depth of focus is quite simple. Rather than splitting the light, we take the single point of focus and we extend it to provide a greater range of vision including intermediate and near vision. <clears throat> and there's many ways you can do this uh, with optics. You can use diffraction as uh, the J&J &J low add diffractive bifocal or the low add trifocal, or you can use phase shift technology such as in the Vivity lens. But you don't have to resort to diffractive optics and it is possible to increase the depth of focus simply by manipulating spherical aberration. Either negative spherical aberration, or as I will show you, in my opinion, preferable with positive spherical aberration. You can also extend the depth of focus by using a pinhole optic. And um, one of the more unusual optics is an asymmetrical uh, rotational asymmetrical optic, such as the uh, optic designed by um, some other lens manufacturers, which can also increase the depth of focus, once again, in a non-diffractive uh, method. So it's fascinating to see the number of different so-called extended depth of focus or enhanced monofocal lenses available today, today. And there's examples on all the different optical principles which I've described. And these are some of the options we have. But when you choose an extended depth of focus lens, it's important to remember that the human eye is not a telescope. The focus isn't fixed, it's continuous. The aperture is variable, unlike the fixed aperture of a telescope. We don't have to worry about chromatic aberration because we have cortical filters for chromatic aberration. And we even have a retinal architecture, which reduces the impact of an aberration like spherical aberration, the Stiles-Crawford effect. <clears throat> and so on the optical bench, for a target fixed at a certain distance, no spherical aberration may be optimum. 
But the reality is that aberrations, pupil size, focal range is dynamic. And when you consider things like near vision, when you consider options like combining myopic defocus, in actual fact, the optimum resolution with extended depth of focus may not be neutral, but may be spherical, positive spherical aberration. And positive spherical aberration and myopic defocus interfere in a constructive um, fashion. There's synergy. And so the combined wavefront is of better contrast and quality and resolution than the wavefront of either myopic defocus alone or spherical aberration alone. Another interesting optical phenomena is that when you have negative spherical aberration, you can see that the impact of even minor decentration is much greater than an optic with positive spherical aberration. And so the Rayner uh, EMV has a unique optic with an aspheric profile, which is optimized for each power in the dioptric range. And this provides a consistent extent of depth of focus, minimizing the loss that you may expect with some spherical aberration. And you can see that the through focus response is quite distinctive when you compare an aberration free optic or a spherical optic compared to an optic with positive spherical aberration or an optic in the green uh, with a trifocal diffractive optic. And I think when it comes to choosing a mechanism for extend of fo extended depth of focus, the real principle of what we're trying to do from a design point of view is based on an understanding that optimum quality vision isn't just a matter of resolution, but it's finding that perfect balance between resolution but retaining adequate depth of focus. You can see in this Landolt C simulation that with an optic with spherical aberration, that the uh, Landolt C is readable through a broader range of defocus than with the aberration free optic. <clears throat> and this optic where the spherical aberration is in the central part of the lens the spherical aberration diminishes towards the periphery to try and retain quality of vision even in poorly lit uh, environments. And the lens still fulfills the requirements, the ANSI and ISO requirements for a high quality monofocal lens. It's most interesting to look at the defocus curve. So you look at the um, log more acuity from minus two and a half to plus two and a half diopters in a half diopter steps. And you can see the extended range of focus of the positive spherical aberration EDF IOL as compared to a standard negative spherical aberration IOL. And this curve gives you some insight to how to use this clinically. Because if you then put the extended depth of focus lens in an eye with modest monovision, minus one and a quarter, you can see the greater overlap between the distance and the near eye. And this is even exaggerated if you use a positive spherical aberration eye well in both eyes. The overlap's greater, and you don't really have monovision, you really have blended vision. If you compare, and this is from actual data of patients that I implanted some years ago, you can see that the bilateral, sorry, the bilateral defocus curve using this lens is quite distinct from the um, defocus curve of a diffractive optic, a bifocal diffractive optic, and different again than the defocus curve of a trifocal optic. And the biggest difference is the intermediate vision, which is really excellent in the extended depth of focus IOL. And a lot of our activities today are more intermediate based with digital media, et cetera, rather than reading small print, perhaps in years gone by. So 
So today, if you look at the defocus curve, you can see that extended depth of focus or enhanced monofocals are not a homogeneous group. You can't for sure say that, well, extended depth of focus, they're all the same. They're not all the same. And the impact of the optic on dysphotopsia, the ability to combine myopic defocus is not the same, depending on the different type of optic that provides that extended depth of focus. Certainly, in this comparison of uh, different types of lenses, the uh, EDF IOL by Rayner performed well. And later on today, we're going to hear even much more uh, important clinical data comparing these different types of optics. Now, most important is the quality of vision. And when I compared the contrast sensitivity uh, with the same patient but different lenses in each eye, found it very difficult to find any difference in impact comparing the um, positive spherical aberration optic to a standard negative aspheric optic, both for topic and mesopic contrast sensitivity. This is the Perth skyline. This is my hometown by night. And um, if you compare that view with a monofocal lens, this is a simulation, it would look quite different with a diffractive um, trifocal or bifocal, or even a diffractive extended depth of focus IOL. Because as I've explained, the category includes lenses which are based uh, including lenses on diffractive optics. Seem to be stuck here. And you, as expected, with a diffractive optic, even a low add uh, bifocal or a low add trifocal optic, you will still get light scatter. You will still get unwanted dysphotopsias. And this is quite distinctive from what occurs with a lens which is non-diffractive based, such as one based on positive spherical aberration. And in addition, depending on the optic, it may not behave as well depending on the type of optical principle. And if you combine, for instance, an element of myopia with a diffractive bifocal or trifocal IOL, you would expect greater dysphotopsia, and you would not see this to the same extent with a lens when you add myopic defocus to a positive spherical aberration IOL. This is data published by Gerd Arfoth recently, and you can see this comparison of resolution targets. But one thing is quite clear. If you want to have predictable near vision, you need to combine some degree of modest monovision or myopia to provide additional reading. And with the Ray-1 EMV using this principle, because it's been optimized for combining with a level of myopic defocus, you have a range of clear vision from distance, intermediate, and near. This is an example of a defocus curve from a colleague, uh, Tung Kwan, in Singapore. And you can see with this optic, the vision uh, is good for distance, excellent for intermediate, and even reasonable at near when distance is targeted in both eyes. But once again, when um, um, myopic defocus is combined, once again, 6.6 six, for distance, 6.7.5 for intermediate, and uh, only dropping to 6.9. So this is the defocus curve using myopic defocus in one eye. So when you choose an optic and an optical solution, there is always a balance between quality of vision and spectacle independence. And I would suggest that total spectacle independence is not perhaps the ideal parameter to judge patient satisfaction. And this is the quandary that you may have a patient who's totally spectacle independent 
with a multifocal, but still not happy with the quality of his vision. And when you look at the options and the balance between quality and reading ability, um, I would suggest that an extended depth of focus or monofocal plus lens such as the Ray 1E in V, based on positive spherical aberration, gives you that best balance. So the optic is attractive. I think many surgeons would consider it for themselves. And considering the ethics of reciprocity, first mentioned in the Mahabharata, perhaps this is something worth considering in your patients. I want to thank you for your attention. So it's my pleasure to move on and introduce the next speaker, who's Damien Gatineau. I can assure you the um, words he's used are reciprocal. I admire Damien greatly. He really is one of the world's leading experts, not just in refractive and cataract surgery, but his deep understanding of optics and optical principles. He's also published widely in many, many publications, peer-reviewed, and he's owner of several patents uh, on IOLs. Damien, it's such a great pleasure. I'm delighted that you're on the panel, that you're involved in Ray 1 EMV, and I'd like you to present uh, your paper uh, on the optics as well. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you, Graham, for the kind words. So um, the title says what I'm going to discuss, reality or myth, um, and we'll use a tool for that which is objective, which is an optical bench testing. So there won't be many clinical issues there. They will come later in the symposium. We will focus on, on, on the objective uh, metrics that we can have today. And uh, I work in the Rothschild Foundation in Paris, France. I'm a consultant for several companies, including uh, Reiner. And uh, me and you, we have been uh, exposed in the uh, recent years to an eruption of new terminologies, which are more or less obscure, and which would try to suggest us that there may be a known optical phenomenon that we could use to design new uh, multifocal or uh, uh, EDOF or uh, improved uh, monofocals. And uh, again, what's interesting is that if you step back and know a bit of optics, all this shatters against the laws of physics because when the light goes in the eye, it only undergoes three or four mechanisms. That is reflection, which is not very useful, absorption, not useful at all, scatter, that's cataract, that's what we want to correct for, and then refraction and diffraction. But to my knowledge, there's not so many more uh, mechanisms that you can use to manipulate the light propagation in those kind of structures. And uh, I think these terms are here to uh, suggest that you, can, you could have the benefits of multifocality without the inherent disadvantages of splitting and sharing the light entering the eye across several foci. So I've been, as Graham said, uh, paying interest for those questions and I like to uh, know what I'm using and uh, with uh, the collaboration of uh, colleagues from Belgium um, who work in the optical uh, industry or uh, who are PhD in optics, we designed a uh, system which enabled us to measure the micron fluctuations on optics of the lens which are listed here. Uh, and we published that. You see Technis, Symphony, Atelisa, Fine Vision uh, in a different um, uh, refractive index. Uh, and uh, fine vision corrected for uh, longitudinal chromatic aberration and panoptics. You see, they are quite more or less similar in some ways, but also different. What they have in common, and that's important, is that you see that the, these structures are not higher than a few microns. So anytime you have an abrupt or a sharp edge of a few micron height, you may think this is a diffractive structure. At least this is commonly fine on uh, all uh, cold diffractive IOLs. And uh, this is another example where it's not sometimes so difficult to relate the function to the, um, uh, to the design because there are simple rules 
to uh, uh, try to see that, for example, a lens will have more or less add power. The larger the grooves or the, the, the zigzag you see, uh, the less power it is. And there is a harmonic relation between the power and the width. And the height is more for controlling chromatic aberration. So the Symphony, for example, was a lens which has been designed for generating a continuous foci, as the manufacturer says, but more simply, it was a diffractive bifocal element corrected for chromatic aberration, hence the height of the steps, which was higher than, for example, a classic trifocal lens. And with larger grooves than for a bifocal for near, because again, the less uh, grooves you have or the wider they are, the less power of the ad. And interestingly, you see, if you relate this groove width to what a trifocal lens b uh, provides, which is near and intermediate, you see that there is a harmonic relation in the height here, which is equivalent to the width that the symphony provided. And that's no mystery, because the intermediate vision add of the fine vision, uh, which I designed, was 175. But you have another pitch, which is twice smaller, which is for the near. So what's important in also there is when you do the math to calculate the height that you need, it's already, as you can see here, less than four microns in both cases and non-chromatic correctable IOLs, it's 1.6 around that. Now you see diffraction seems a bit like, oh, diffraction means halo. So, uh, and at the time of the uh, uh, Edof Symphony, it was said by the manufacturer that this lens was not really diffractive, but it was. Now there are true non-diffractive IOLs on the left, which are the Isopure, the Technis, the Luxmart from BNL, and the Reiner, which is different from all the other I cited because this is so far the only um, monofocal plus which uses a positive spherical aberration mechanism as was highlighted by Graham in the lecture. And uh, this, so we are more maybe familiar with how it works. And there was also the introduction a couple of years ago of a new IOL and uh, EDORF Monofocal Plus, I don't know how to say what it is, but it was designed by what it was not supposed to be by the manufacturer. Again, it's designed first as a non-diffractive IOL, which is bizarre to me to design something by what it's not. But um, this is a claim to get uh, the I or the IOL with a wavefront focusing stretching X-wave technology, which is also uh, uh, putting like a question mark because all lenses are stretching uh, the wavefront in some ways, else there would be not any uh, op optical interaction. So we are facing the challenge of unclear IOL optic definitions, technology descriptions, and this is why it triggered us in my department to investigate these advanced optic and see really what they were uh, um, in the eye. And when you look in the eye, for example, array uh, one EMV lens on the left, and you compare it to a VVT on the right, you see it's clearly different. I wouldn't be able to say that the l lens on the left is uh, refractive monofocal or refractive multifocal because it's smooth. But on the right, at C, and you've seen it if you use that lens or seen patient with, those little, uh, concentric zones uh, which uh, evoke or can evocate a diffractive structure or element or a combined refractive diffractive structure because as soon as it's abrupt there's diffraction optically speaking. So you can see clearly the ring-like structure on the VVT and you don't see anything on the Reiner. And uh, this is now my time also to express my gratitude to uh, Dr. Benjamin Stern, who sits here on the first row, is my uh, PhD fellow. He came uh, last uh, year. Um, I mean, he's here for now uh, 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 almost uh, eight months. And uh, he's paying a lot of uh, his time, maybe all of his time. Uh, I don't know if you, uh, maybe when you leave the department late and you, I don't know what you do, but I suspect you still think about these things. So uh, we have a machine which we acquire, which enables you to uh, investigate the optical properties of the IOLs, including diffractive IOLs. This instrument is called Nemo Tempo. It's, it's provided by a, a Belgium company, Lambda X, in Nivelle, Belgium. And it's an interferometer, so I won't describe the properties of the instrument, but it's a to make it simple, it's like a photophocometer for spectacle lenses, but now it's for IOL, so it's much more complex. And you can put a cartridge with the IOL inside, put 
put the cartridge in instrument and perform several measurements which are processed with a very high speed computer uh, uh, and that's, that's why this technology is new because the calculation behind is enormous. And what's interesting from the optical properties, you can derive the profiles of the diffractive element. So these are showing you the, just a diffractive structure which is extracted from the base curve of the lenses. And you see here two lenses, a very beautiful one, the pod FGF, fine vision, with a kind of a Christmas tree design, I like it. And another one, which is arguably as nice, more like a castle battlement, I would say, the, <laughs> the Reiner trifocal uh, element. But what you can see, regardless of your preference aesthetically, is that they are completely different. I mean, to me, I cannot say I've been copied there. So we I won't be able to sue Reiner on this thing. But other companies are more uh, infringing, I would say. But this is clearly a different mechanism. I and mean, that's nice to see this uh, uh, objectively again. Uh, and you see, that's what we measured, and now we can try to compare this to what the manufacturer provided as a description, and we were pleased to see that it's very similar to what uh, Reiner disclosed, so at least there is some transparency here, not only in the lens material, but in the communication of the element provided to the, to the doctors, and I think this is enjoyable because it's not often the case, and you won't find many description of IOL diffractive structures in other competitor uh, booth. And uh, now the VVT uh, alluded to, uh, as you can see, the profile extracted from the base curve has an intriguing shape. It's not to say a kind of a full diffractive IOL, but it certainly has diffractive structures again. See the height of the structure is about one micron, very low, and it's sharp, it's not smooth and continuous. So there must be something which any physicist in optics would describe as a as dif diffractive element. It's not a bad word, it's just a physical truth that we should be aware of to better judge what we do. It doesn't say the lens is good or bad, that's not my point. I just try to stick to uh, optical reality there. So, uh, the VVT show possibly uh, a diffractive element there. Now what the, about the Rainer? The Rainer has been measured also. It provides positive circular aberration. This is a wavefront of other element and uh, what's interesting is when you measure several lenses that's Benjamin's graph here he measured several uh, spherical elements IOLs the EMV which is the blue and other lenses uh, using negative spherical aberration and you see that the lens provides a constant spherical aberration throughout most of the optic and it's positive uh, and it doesn't go up much toward the edge. On the contrary, it goes down to preserve optical quality for large pupil diameters. And finally, uh, this is another brilliant idea that Benjamin had because we know usually manufacturers, they provide you with a graph which fits their goal most. So they would select the best corneal spherical aberration, which is usually balanced by their own lens, and the best pupil size that makes the lens looking the most efficient. So what we did here is a matrix where you have uh, x-axis pupil size and the corneal spherical aberration, which we know varies in the human population. And what you see is that for average pupil diameter, which is three millimeter for most patient, physiophagic patient, and average spherical aberration, which is usually between 0 0.2 and 0.3 microns positive, the lens has the highest depth of focus. You can see the scale here, almost two diopters, 2.5. And outside of this zone, still it performs well, providing 1.5 to sometimes uh, or around those values of uh, depths of focus. And that makes this lens quite robust also to pupil dynamics when it comes to uh, uh, improving, increasing the depth of focus. So in conclusion, uh, we showed that uh, Reiner is a company that so far accurately explains their advanced technologies, and I hope it will continue like that. Uh, it's a fully non-diffractive IOL, I'm speaking about the EMV, and uh, I think uh, the depth of focus has been shown to be at least 1.5 diopters or more throughout all those combinations. And um, I think uh, we now need to uh, learn more about the in vivo measurement to see if they are in line with those findings. Thank you very much for your attention. My pleasure to introduce the next speaker. We're very uh, proud to have Oliver Findle, who is really um, um, 
well renowned for studying um, different optics, different lenses, and providing uh, objective evaluation and information. He's also um, a, an expert on ROLs, and uh, of course he is our host and president of ESCRS. So during your term, Oliver, you're, uh, you're going to be remembered for the most successful ESCRS meeting that we've had. You're going to be remembered also for your introducing concerns with uh, green and uh, uh, issues and um, harnessing different societies on that same pathway. And also renowned for um, creating the most memorable ball and function that I can remember. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me introduce Oliver who will talk about results from a comparative prospective study. study is Ray one EMV. Well, thank you very much for the kind words. Yes, the ball was nice, but it was also long, so I'm a little tired, I must admit. And that probably is true for a few of you. But I'll still try to take you through these slides uh, in these next few minutes. Um, so these are my financial disclosures. We, are, uh, we did perform a trial with Rainer, which was also supported by them through an unrestricted grant to the Institute, but I have no personal financial interest. Um, so, you know, you've seen a lot about the optics now, and so now we're going sort of more into the clinical um, results. And the idea of this trial is a randomized controlled single center trial. Um, and it was actually, let me say, quite ambitious to do this trial in, with this comparator, namely the Rayner EMV, which you've heard quite a bit about just now, and the Acrosoft Vivity lens, which really, as you've just seen now, and I hadn't seen that data before, uh, but is is really an e an EDOF lens, an enhanced depth of focus lens. Um, at least that's what most people would would put it into. And and as you've seen, the the Ray One, the EMV is is really a, a monofocal plus. Uh, and and one of the reasons why we go for monofocal plus is to try to attempt to really have much less of the side effects that we may have with some EDOF lenses. And now I've come to learn that it's not just a, a refractive eat of the vivity in this case possibly, but actually has a diffractive element to it, at least to a certain extent. We had 48 patients in this uh, trial, and we did target for half a diopter of mini monovision, because that's something I like to do in, 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 in practice, um, and that's what we did in this trial. And the outcomes, the main outcome was difference in binocular uncorrected intermediate visual acuity at 66 centimeters, so that is uh, the main um, outcome, and then obviously we measured all other things uh, as well, but that's what the, lens, the, the, the trial was powered to. Uh, here you have the two lenses again. I don't think I have to say much about them because you've heard them. You've just seen uh, the comparisons e even in the optical bench and obviously gives you more information than what you have on this slide. This is just to show you the implantation process. As you know, the lens is, is a pre-loaded lens. Um, is a hydrophilic acrylic lens, has a very long track record concerning the material. Also, this, uh, in this case, we're seeing the EMV Toric, which was introduced into our trial um, a, a little later on, because when it became available, we started, of course, uh, without the Toric component. And as you can see here in this image, you do not see any diffractive elements, because there are none, and you also don't see any central zones of any kind because uh, it really does look from the outside like a monofocal lens. Um, so this is uh, the comparison of the two groups, which were randomized, as I said. Um, and you can see here that these are the targets we set for the dominant eye and the non-dominant eye concerning uh, target refraction. Uh, these are the kind of exams we did. Uh, two weeks a few, but main outcome at three months. And you can see we did a, a whole host of things apart from the visual acuity measurements. And you can see here we used the Optech vision test, the 6500, which is well established for contrast sensitivity measurements, both under mesopic and photopic conditions, as well as with and without glare. We also used the Salzburg reading test, which uh, essentially the patient has to read uh, sentences and we can, and by the machine listens and has a microphone, um, and, and you can see the words per minute the reading time, and we did that at 40 centimeters in a standardized way. And for assessing halos, we used the Aston holometer, which is also well established and has been, um, essentially gives you a small glare source right in front of the, 
of this um, iPad, and, and then the patient um, has to try to s uh, assess the size of the halo, which is of course also of interest, especially for nighttime driving. So let's look at the spherical equivalent. And what you can see here is uh, both for the dominant eye and then for the non-dominant eye, the Ray 1 EMV and the Vivity. And what you can see is that unfortunately, for, and this has also to do with the initial IOL constants which we used because the lens was really new and was sort of not on the market yet. Uh, we, we did achieve a little less uh, minus uh, in the Ray EMV, EMV uh, compared to the Alcon Vivity, which was already on the market since a while. Uh, and that was also the, um, adapted afterwards. So you'll see that here we have uh, a slightly uh, more deviation uh, for, than we had uh, originally uh, planned for. Let's look at uh, the visual acuity. And this is now a first uh, uncorrected binocular visual acuity for different distances. So distance, 66 centimeters and 40. And 66 is the one we're powered for, as you can see. You can see the numbers here in the left. And you can see here between the Rainer and the Alcon, there is actually no difference, at least not significant difference. We do see, and, and, and also for distance, by the way, we do see a difference for near, as you would expect, I should say, because this is a monofocal plus in that range. And here we have sort of dealing with, let me say, an EDOF lens. Um, you do have a, a significantly better near acuity uncorrected binocular. This is always binocular because, again, this is a monovision setting, as I told you, about half a diopter difference. You could now postulate that if we had slightly more myopic outcomes on a non-dominant eye with a Rayner EMV, these bars would probably be a little higher. We did the same for mesopic, and you have similar results for mesopic conditions. Let's have a look at the binocular defocus curves. Interestingly, very similar for photopic and mesopic, at least under the conditions we used. And you can see that the alconvivity is has a higher um, range, especially in that defocus of about one and a half to two and a half diopters. A um, little worse at distance, as you can see here, um, if you look at the details, and that's something we also hear about the vivity, and that's also my clinical impression, having user lens quite a bit, that there are some patients who say, mm, for distance, it's just not as good as they would expect. So these are patients who are quite critical, um, um, and, and that's an answer you get once in a while, and I think um, that that's something we hear from, from several surgeons. What about contrast sensitivity? Um, you can see here that in black the Ray 1 EMV, photopic, and then photopic with glare. For uh, here photopic and down here for mesopic. And in red you can see the Vivity photopic and then including glare. And you can see that the Vivity actually um, is lower than the Ray EMV in pretty much uh, many of these uh, spatial frequencies. What about halo size? You can see that the halo size for the Vivity is larger. And that's also statistically significant. Here you can see the box plots for the two. There's obviously always some overlap, but uh, these are the averages, of course, uh, throughout the entire um, uh, um, perimeter. Reading speed, as you would expect, at 40 centimeters, the reading speed is quick, is, is uh, better uh, for uh, the so the words per minute uh, for the vivity because it has better near function, as I showed before. Again a combination of it being probably some kind of, let me say, EDOF lens, although I don't like the term that much, but let's use it for, for, for just for, for this, uh, this talk. And also because, again, we tended to have a little more myopia on the non-dominant eye with the Vivity group compared to the EMV group. So to conclude, we had this mini monovision trial of half a diopter comparing a monofocal plus lens, the Rayner EMV, with an EDOF IOL, the Vivity, you can see the differences here in, 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 in the post-operative refraction on the non-dominant eye, just to again show you the slight difference between groups. We saw no significant difference between groups for distance and intermediate vision. This is uncorrected, but we did see better uncorrected near vision for the EDOF IOL. There's a trend for a slightly better contrast sensitivity with the EME group, especially under mesopic conditions with glare, as you saw in the uh, one graph. We didn't see a, di a significant difference regarding uh, reading speed. This is actually for intermediate, I'm sorry. We did see a difference uh, regarding reading speed for near. 
the photic phenomenon, the EMV had a smaller halo size. Of course, you would want to do subjective um, um, you know, questionnaires for this photopsia. The problem is with a, st a study of about 50 patients, that is really a difficult issue to do. If you want to look at these um, ratings, you need more patients than we had. So from my perspective, the Rayner EMV IOL is a monofocal plus, especially suited for monovision strategy. As you could see from our trial, it probably makes sense to uh, uh, go for a little more monovision, let's say 0.75, and that's also what I do now in my clinical routine, because that will give you more near vision. I know that uh, Graham goes to, my, to, to one diopter, 125 diopter, which is a real monovision um, sort of approach, which the patient, of course, uh, needs to be uh, um, um, discussed with the patient beforehand. But you can also use it as your standard monofocal IOL with very good contrast sensitivity. The photic phenomenon seem to be very similar or comparable to standard monofocal IOLs. And essentially, you will have uncompromised binocular distance vision, which is, of course, important if you use it in this aspect. Uh, and you will have some benefit for intermediate vision and sometimes even some useful near vision. I also want to talk just about a new... Um, uh, essentially um, version of Ray Pro. Uh, they've updated it, so that is a software which you may want to use for your patients. What it does is it sends out emails to patients asking them for prompts, five questions, and then you have a very nice cockpit where you can see how your patients are doing after surgery, and the patients get that in certain intervals. So I think it's something very nice to audit your patients just concerning their subjective ratings of how surgery went, not necessarily only with the EMV lens, but any lens or any Rayner lens you may be using. Also, the APASCRS symposium we had in June in Singapore, um, that is actually online uh, and I think is, is quite informative. As you can see, I was also involved in that um, uh, with others and of, was chaired by Graham. So something you may want to uh, if, see if you want to have some more information. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Oliver. My pleasure to introduce our final speaker, so Alan Barsom from the UK. He's the director and founding partner of OCL Vision. Um, Multi-talented, interests in refractive surgery, cataract surgery, premium lenses, and, ca and corneal surgery as well. And uh, Alan, you were the first to implant the Ray-1 in 2020, so you have a vast experience. And today you're going to tell us about comparing Ray-1 EMV and Acrosoft RQ. Thanks very much for that kind introduction and good afternoon, everybody. So these are my disclosures of companies that I uh, do or have uh, consulted for or received travel grants for, which includes Rayner. I'd like to acknowledge the other surgeons at OCL Vision who have contributed uh, patients to this study and the optometric team led by Ruby Thompson and the R&D team led by Maureen Gobe, who have um, collected and uh, analyzed the data that I'm going to present today. So this was a retrospective study with six months of follow-up comparing the Ray-1 EMV with the Acrosoft Vivity lens. Uh, we looked at objective assessments, visual acuity, refraction, and subjective outcomes using the Ray Pro questionnaires for patient satisfaction. 820 eyes of 517 patients were included. Um, you've already heard about how the two lenses work, so I'm going to skip through this. Um, these are the preoperative um, uh, considerations, and you can see that about 300 patients in each group, which is the majority, had bilateral implantation, with the uh, minority having unilateral implantation. The group also includes uh, the toric versions of both lenses and non-toric, depending on what patients needed. Most eyes were targeted for emetropia, so everyone had emetropia targeted in the dominant eye. Um, and in the non-dominant eye, it varied. And of note is that 10% more eyes had a more myopic target in the Vivity group. So minus 0.75 or more. The, um, the eyes within the NHS normative values of plus or minus a half or one were excellent in both groups. So what do we see? Um, well, we saw, as you've, you've heard in the, in, in the other studies and in the theoretical studies, but it's nice to show in a big um, kind of, let's say, real world retrospective study, that there was a statistically significant better uncorrected distance visual acuity and corrected distance visual acuity uh, in the Ray-1 EMV group versus Vivity. 
Uh, there was no significant difference in the um, uncorrected intermediate visual acuity, uh, and we saw a modest but statistically significant difference uh, in uncorrected near visual acuity favoring the Vivity lens, and that's to the tune of our study of three letters. Um, you can see that the 50% uh, of patients achieved 0.2 log mile or better for, for binocular uncorrected intermediate vision, um, and it's very comparable between the two IOL groups in terms of uh, what we were achieving there for intermediate. For cylindrical reduction, again, both lenses performing very well for plus or minus a half and plus or minus one, uh, but more eyes in the Ray-1 EMV group um, had post-operative refractive cylinder of 0 0.25 or less, um, and more eyes in the Ray-1 EMV group um, had post-operative refractive cylinder of 0.75 or less, so slightly better cylindrical control for the uh, EMV patients. What about the questionnaire? Well, we sent this out to 300 patients who were binocularly implanted, and we received response um, from 42%. Um, and satisfaction was excellent with both. Um, in this group, it's not only cataract patients, also refractive lens exchange patients, so maybe a little bit more demanding. Um, but there's 84% satisfaction with the Ray-1 EMV and 78% satisfaction uh, with the Vivity lens. We presume that difference in satisfaction to be due to either tolerability of uh, mini monovision or the improved reading, uh, the improved distance vision that you get with the Ray-1 EMV clearly matters to patients. So in conclusion, the Ray-1 EMV demonstrated significantly better uh, uncorrected distance vision and corrected distance vision. Uh, intermediate vision was equally good between the two lenses. Uh, we saw good uncorrected near vision uh, in the EMV group, but slightly better, three letters better uh, in the Vivity group. But expectations were matched or even surpassed in the EMV group given the difference in lens design and how the lenses are actually positioned in the market. Um, and that difference in reading vision may actually be um, explicable by the fact that we targeted a little bit more monovision in the Vivity group. We saw more effective post-operative cylinder reduction in the uh, EMV toric group uh, and higher patient satisfaction levels uh, in the EMV group. So what are the future considerations? Well, we need to do a subgroup analysis to compare like for like with equivalent amounts of myopic target and the non-dominant eye, so we can see exactly what the level of difference uh, is. Um, and it's interesting to note also in Oliver's study that there was a bit more myopia for whatever reason in the, uh, achieved in the, in the Vivity group. Um, we want to investigate higher levels of monovision, so 1.25 or more. Um, it may be better tolerated given the higher satisfaction levels, and we may be able to achieve equal reading vision compared with the Vivity if we do so. We want to drill down into our questionnaire results and find out what the causes of non-satisfaction were in the minority of patients and look more carefully at dysphotopsia. Um, and I think also very relevant in today's kind of inflationary market of where everything's more expensive for everyone uh, is a cost-benefit analysis because the cost difference between the Ray-1 EMV and the Vivity lens, given the very modest difference in how they perform, is enormous. Um, you know, it's huge even for a small practice. So we'd like to do that as well in order to see um, whether it's, it's really worth it to use a more expensive lens. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Elon. We'll have some time for discussion and I'll open that discussion. Perhaps I'll ask Oliver for your first, for the first comment. It was a great study. Um, the theme of the symposium is all about balance. So do you think the Ray-1 EMV has got the balance right? You have to choose your line, which you, your fulcrum, and then you make up what you don't have with monovision. That's the concept. Would you trade off, would you prefer a little bit more reading, or is maintaining that quality for distance low, halo? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think for me, it's always critical to have good distance vision. Um, and I think then I can, I can, that's the way I'm doing it now, I can tighter the monovision, the amount of monovision of what the patient actually wants slash also expects. So if it's a patient who really wants to have very good reading vision, then this is probably not the right approach to start with. That's my take on it. Then I would probably go for a trifocal with all the negative aspects that may have, which I don't do very much actually. I try to take talk the patients out of trifocal technology, although I do use it sometimes, of course. But I think if it's a patient who says, you know, I just want some intermediate vision, blah, 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 I'll go for maybe half a diopter or 0.75. If it's a myope, I tend to do, do a lot more, like 125, because they can usually you know, deal with it very well. So I think it really, I, I, can, I can titrate that. And I think you get a feeling for that very soon. It doesn't take you too long. So even if you don't, you're not used to monovision or haven't done it very much, 
I think it's something which you'll get a hang of in within, you know, 20, 30 patients. Yeah, I, I'm an enthusiast for monovision, and I'm hoping the Ray One, which can make monovision more tolerable, will tempt people into exploring some of the benefits that that can achieve. So, Damien, you really explained to us beautifully about the different optics, and you understand better than most, once again, that you have to make choices and you have to make decisions. And um, where do you think we're headed in the future? I don't have a crystal ball, so it's difficult. Um, I think uh, we learn from previous experiences and we probably will see a kind of a efflorescence of new lenses, uh, which is good for us because I think the future is more customized the choice of the lens to the patient. We don't have customized lens yet, so that's maybe the next thing. I would say pupil customization could be also a nice uh, add to the technology. But uh, so far what we could do now is, because we have such a variety of lenses, if we had a system that can pick up the right lens for this expected performance in that patient, that would be helpful and probably we would use several lenses model that may fit better this eye with this expectation and with this uh, uh, per uh, expected performance. Great. Alon, very uh, interesting results. Fascinated by the satisfaction difference between the two. And I guess we still have to learn why, what would make people more satisfied. And you know, you've got vast experience. You, you did conjecture a little bit. So what do you think the reason for the difference in satisfaction could be due to? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. You know, we, we titled the symposium Balancing Quantity and Quality of Vision. Um, and I think that with the Ray-1 EMV, we clearly have a technology that maximizes the, um, the quality of vision, um, potentially sacrificing a little bit of quantity, modestly. Um, and maybe that's reflected in patient satisfaction. So, you know, what they really want is good quality of vision and spectacle independence or the level thereof, providing they're mostly spectacle independent, um, they see as a bonus, if, if you can get them a bit more. Um, it's possible that tolerability of monovision in the, in the EMV group uh, explains that difference. But, um, you know, I just kind of, I find, I honestly find work less stressful because I can yeah. counsel patients about technology where, that is, and if they do have problems at night, which is very rare, it's fully reversible. They can just put a pair of glasses on when they drive up the motorway or the freeway in the rain and it's difficult and they're plano in both eyes, no problems. So it's, uh, it's a great introduction for surgeons who are maybe not using presbyopia correcting or addressing lens technology. Yeah, thanks, Alon. From the audience, anybody have any questions for the panel? Yeah. Hi, could I ask, would you uh, avoid using uh, the EMV in patients who have negative spherical aberrations preoperatively? Interesting question, and I'm going to ask um, who would like to answer that question. With negative, if the patient's yeah. got negative, yes. I would not non recommend it, but you may have a different performance. Uh, again, those lenses have been optimized for most uh, realistic corneal profiles, and if you have a negative aberration, you may have a patient with keratoconus with a certain level of corneal multifocality, or a post hyperopic LASIK eye with the same level of multifocality. And then you may uh, decide to put the lens, but it, if it behaves a bit differently, that's expected, of yeah. course. But you're not going to face a bad thing. Theoretically, I would say that the lens will lose a little depth of focus because the negative spherical aberration will be balanced by the positive spherical aberration of the rhino. So the total eye will have less positive spherical aberration than if you had started with an eye with average spherical aberration, which is positive. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. There's no negative effect. If you really wanted that patient to have spectacle independence, that's where you use the magic of monovision and choose accordingly to compensate for perhaps less extended depth of focus than someone who didn't have negative spherical aberration. Question, there was a question over here. Yep. Yes. Um, what about early AMD and Ray-1 EMV? Do I have to? We, we hardly hear you. 
What about early AMD, like you seeing some Drusen? Do I have to ditch then Ray One EMV or can yes. I still? Alon, I'll ask you. For, for Drusen only, I don't really worry. If they have frank geographic atrophy or they've lost, they clearly lost photoreceptors, then I personally don't use it. Um, but there are many surgeons like Gerd Alpha, for example, loves to use it. He thinks that you're potentially increasing the range of focus at which you might get focus on the macula, given that they might be f fixating eccentrically. So there are theoretical advantages, believe it or not, actually for using it in such patients. But personally, if they have atrophy, I don't. But Drusen, it doesn't bother me. Okay, yeah. thank you. I, I think those are good answers. I think it's very difficult to show a deficit as regarding distance vision and quality of vision between this enhanced monofocal IOL. Oh well, um, you really struggle in the laboratory even to show a, a deficit. So I'd be comfortable, I think. I don't think the difference in your outcome would be different with a monofocal. Um, there's a question over there or, yep, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, ask about uh, uh, depth of focus central shift, which is different with uh, negative and positive spheric aberration based lenses. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it's the direction to do uh, myopic sight with negative. And there is a, a comment over this uh, this could be better uh, for presbyopic correcting areas. On the other hand, uh, the uh, direction on the reverse side with p like uh, Ray-1 EMV, uh, what do you think about this? Wh which one is better uh, for sure. presbyopic correcting area? Yes, so um, thanks for the question because I um, obviously have some thoughts about that. And I think positive is better for a few reasons. When you looked at the defocus curve, there was very much a asymmetry or a slant in a defocus curve, like an elbow. And the direction of that elbow is in the right direction for increased reading. And the negative also has an asymmetry, but in the opposite direction. It's not in the right direction. And actually, it's positive that has a myopic shift in the best focus. Positive spherical collaboration, the best focus is shifted towards the myopia side. But if you base your refraction on the best vision, that kind of disappears. But you're still left with that very interesting asymmetry, which is in the right direction. And I don't think we should underestimate the sensitivity of an optic which has negative spherical aberration to minor decentration. That's a very real difference. Would you agree with that? Don't yes, you? and I would add, this is a good question to emphasize something. Uh, for those of you who were in the press biopia session yesterday, I discussed this on corneal spherical aberration, but that's the same thing. What you have to understand is negative or positive spherical aberration doesn't work per se to provide increased useful depth of focus. So if you have negative spherical aberration, you need to have myopia in your system. When I say myopia, is negative defocus in the center of the pupil because what negative spherical spherical collaboration creates is less power to the periphery. So in other words, if you have a, an eye which is emetropic, no defocus, and you have negative spherical collaboration, it's completely useless because the negative spherical collaboration means less power t toward the periphery of the pupil, that is hyperopia, so the patient's not going to be happy. So in press B LASIK with increased prolateness in IOLs which use negative spherical collaboration, you need to target a slight myopic error, paraxially, in the center of the pupil, else it's not going to work. Whereas, with a positively aberrated IOL, you should target emetropia, because the central part of the pupil will be more or less emetropic, and the increase in the power towards the periphery provides the improved depth of focus for the intermediate vision. So, it's completely different. If it's complex to you, just think in cross-section, Draw the rays yourself and see where the retina has to be to benefit from the, for the maximal depth of focus. And you'll find again that for negative, the eye must be centrally myopic, whereas for positive, the eye must be centrally emetropic. That's, that's how it is. An interesting observation, if you look at who has the best vision um, of the 
of the patient, patient or just a normal profile. It's not people with no aberration. It's people with slightly positive spherical aberration, not very different than what we're putting in EMV, which is not very much. And maybe it's something to do with the curved nature of our retina as opposed to a flat photoreceptor. But the laboratory idea of what's best doesn't always correlate to what's best clinically. But if you want 6-3 vision, you need a little bit of positive spherical aberration, which is fascinating. Sorry, there was a last two questions. Who, who's going to be first? Yeah. Thank you. Um, do, do you think having so collaboration in the system makes it more difficult to get an accurate subjective refraction afterwards? And do you have any tips for that? It depends how much. And uh, the Ray 1 EMV is carefully balanced not to give too much. And that's not been my experience. I've always found it uh, quite straightforward to get a sharp focus. Uh, Alan, have you had that experience? Yeah, I mean, the relationship between defocus and spheric aberration is, is interesting in, cl in kind of clinical practice. My experience with both positive and negative spheric aberration is that with positive spheric aberration, they might accept a more myopic refraction, albeit it's not reflected necessarily in the visual acuity because the unaided vision will be very good. Um, and with negative spheric aberration, they might accept a slightly more hyperopic um, refraction. And I think that w the, the way Damien was explaining it also um, supports that. There is that spread, but you can find the best focus. That's what I'm trying to say. You, c you can find the best focus, even though you have some leeway. Yep. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, L last question. I guess the last one. Yeah. Uh, when I was starting to use uh, Reiner uh, EMV, uh, I actually targeted mini and moderate monovision. And the problem was, uh, the patients became more myopic, especially in the non-dominant eye, when I expected. So, and I am talking about the manifest refraction, not about the outer refractometer or, or whatever. What modern formula mm -hmm. would you recommend to people to have the more targeted, not the shifted refraction? Yes. So if you ask me, I will tell you Barrett Universal 2. If you ask... <laughs> Damien here will tell you DGS, but either of those two, would you agree, Damien, <laughs> would be good. But in a, on a serious note, I think what you're uh, experiencing is possibly some, um, uh, let's say, uh, uncertainty about what the constant should be. Yeah, that's because it's a new lens, mm -hmm. uh, just now the d data is sufficient and uh, I'm sure in the next month or two, we will be able to provide a more definite uh, constant for the different formulae. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Look, with, with that, I'll draw to an end. I want to thank my panel. We lost uh, Oliver, but uh, Damien and uh, Alon, thank you. Uh, thank you all for attending and listening to it. And thank you, Raina, for providing the opportunity. Thank you very much. <laughs>